Hello, welcome back to History of Wine and the Vine. I'm Emily Kate. So today marks the final installment of our History of Wine and Art series. And whereas we were looking at all ancient Greek vase paintings and Egyptian tomb decorations and Roman sculptures, this week we're going to move ourselves over to medieval Europe and we're actually going to look at tapestries. So tapestries were very important um, to the kind of medieval household for three reasons. One, they were very portable. Now the people in medieval Europe had many houses. Well, the, the nobility had many houses. And although that sounds very luxurious, they didn't actually have, let's say they had three houses. They didn't have three of everything. They didn't have three dining sets or three sets of artwork or anything like that. They had to bring everything with them. And tapestries provided a very portable um, kind of form of art that they were able to roll up and stick in a caravan and get going. Um, so there was that. Then there was the fact that there were a lot of fires um, in medieval Europe. So there were constantly fires because people were cooking with fire. They needed fire to see with candles at night um, and they needed fire to stay warm. So this provided a very easily kind of salvageable thing. So with a family would run out of the house and um, the kind of servants would be running around and trying to salvage things. And this was kind of an easy thing to grab off the wall, roll up, salvage, and then move on to the next thing, as opposed to maybe a different piece of art that would be harder to move. Now, the last reason is because this actually provided warmth. So this is a woven tapestry and um, this is the equivalent of putting a carpet on the floor only on the wall. So it actually insulated um, these big cavernous rooms that they were staying in and made them a little bit more bearable in the winter. Now this tapestry I chose specifically to start with because our good friend Bacchus is right in the middle of it. This is actually at the Met in New York City, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it is the 12 Ages of Man, and this is um, Autumn. So this is a four-part series, and this is the third section in the four-part series, and it depicts life as it is divided into 12 periods of six years. So Bacchus is in the middle, and he's kind of surrounded by um, other kind of tableaus and scenes and the one I want to talk about is right up here. So this is a scene of a vintage and these people are picking um, the fruit of the vine and what's interesting to me is that this is constantly being represented. So this idea of the passage of time, this is the 12 stages of man, this is the harvest, this is Bacchus and this is such a reoccurring theme because if you think about kind of the visual imagery of the vine versus when it's fertile in the um, in the harvest stage and it has the vines and the leaves and the grapes and everybody's around it and everything like that, it's a very fertile um, visual image. But if you think about it in the winter, it's almost dead. It has no leaves. It's brown. It's being cut. And it's just a very, very striking image. And that dichotomy of the vine is something that gets it associated a lot of times with the passage of time. And that's an example of it here. Now, moving forward, we're going to go to a tapestry I couldn't miss, the Bayou Tapestry. And a little fact for you guys is that this is actually not a tapestry. This is actually an embroidery because it is wool yarn on linen, but it is always called tapestry and I was not going to miss an opportunity to share it with you guys. So we're going to talk about it today. This is the tiniest little snapshot of it. The entire thing is actually 230 feet long. So to put that in perspective, that's three tennis courts. Um, and it displays history visually from 1064, and it's all about the Norman conquest of England up until the Battle of Hastings, and that's in 1066. So to get a sense of the enormity of it, I have a couple stats for you guys. So it displays over 600 people, over 190 horses and mules, and then over 500 other animals. So this is a big, big project. And what is great about it, though, is that it can tell us about so many different things. It can tell us about clothing and buildings, military tactics and food and weapons, attitudes, views, and all kinds of different relations between different civilizations. So what's happening here, and 
I'll let you know how we know what's happening because this is something of a cartoon. So if you look, we have the visual representation over here, but if you'll notice, this is actually written um, in Latin. And much like a cartoon like we have nowadays, or like the ancient Egyptian tomb paintings we were looking at, um, these actually kind of narrate. So you have this narration of what's happening below so that there can be no mistaking. Um, and what's happening here is that Duke William has ordered the building of ships and the provisions of his army. And what that consists of is weapons, men, and supplies. So let's take a look. We have weapons up here kind of like the arrow um, for a bow and arrow. We have men, and then we have supplies. Now, you might have guessed the supplies, that's a wine cask. So we kind of get a sense of the incredible importance of wine um, as a provision for an army that's going out and trying to fight battles, um, they were bringing their wine with them. So when an army got to a certain place, they would actually go out and kind of forage for food. So they would kind of just ravage the countryside and pick up all the pigs and cows and anything that they could find in order, or plants in order to um, feed the army. But wine, they were not going to be there for that long to make the wine. They couldn't um, do that. So they had to bring the wine with them because that was again, a safe and reliable drinking um, option. So we have kind of this incredible importance of wine in military history um, from this medieval tapestry. And if you look a little bit ahead in the medieval tapestry over here, um, you have, this is kind of a banquet scene. So I'm going to give you a rough translation of what these say in Latin. So first we have that the meat is being cooked um, and that the attendants have prepared and are serving it. And then we have the phrase, and here a bishop blesses the food and drink. And that's actually what is right above this little table with the food and drink on it. And here are the gentlemen um, that are of the army and obviously a bishop. So this bishop is actually um, blessing the food and drink. Now this is incredible to understand because you know, if it's being represented here, there's a good chance that um, this was kind of normal or de rigueur, that this would be um, happening in other instances. So now we can think about to ourselves that there was somebody actually blessing the wine on these military journeys, um, and that is pretty wonderful to think about. Now moving on, this is um, hanging, uh, it's in the Musée de Cluny, which is a medieval museum in France. This is from the Southern Netherlands, and it's from the early 16th century. So this shows um, the stages of winemaking. So over on the right, and we read it from right to left, which is very similar to how we read the ancient Egyptian tomb painting, which I think is a nice detail. And we can see a lot of different stages that are represented here, from picking to pressing to the first drink. Um, and what's great is, so let's read it this way. So we have over here, as you can see, over here are the different um, vines, and people, the vines are actually trained in an interesting manner. If you remember, um, or if you want to look back, uh, the ancient Egyptians actually had kind of a um, half moon shape uh, represented in their vines, and these vines actually go straight up. So these vines are, um, obviously they have a lot of leaves on them, this is harvest time, and you can see that the grapes are being picked by everybody and being put into these baskets. Um, which is fairly common. And then if you move over to the other side over here, you can see that the wine is actually being pressed. So the grapes are being pressed. Now, if you look at what they're being pressed in, this is a surefire way to determine that this is um, a medieval tapestry and not something from earlier because it's actually being pressed um, in a barrel. And what's interesting about this is that the barrel was not represented in earlier works because it was a distinctly medieval operation to be pressing your wine in barrel. Um, and before, instead of this gentleman is actually holding on to the sides, there's also a way um, that's represented quite often where a plank of wood is actually placed upon the top and somebody actually hoists themselves up on their hands to balance themselves and then presses the grapes um, from there. Now, this is in stark contrast to the ancient Egyptian style, which was to kind of hollow out something and kind of plaster it over and put the grapes in there as opposed to creating an entirely new um, 
basin and also the ancient Egyptians kind of um, put over a contraption over the top of the barrel and hung down uh, ropes in order to hold onto the ropes so that people didn't slip when they were squishing these grapes. Um, then when you travel kind of up, you have the representations of fermentation happening over here. Again, happening in wood, um, very different to the ancient representations. And then when you have over here, you have the first taste of the wine. So a ceremonial first taste, it's kind of being poured from a jug. And um, this gives us a great idea of what a typical harvest scene might have looked like in the Middle Ages. And as you can see, it is extremely different from what um, in, in many finer details, it's extremely different from what happened um, in ancient times, what we see on the tombs. Um, so that kind of sets apart this medieval tapestry. So I hope you enjoyed this little trek through medieval tapestries depicting wine. I hope you learned something and enjoyed the History of Wine and Art series, and I will see you next week. Cheers!